Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today is Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. Tonight's format is an open forum, so we're, we'll be doing these typically other, every other broadcast, depending upon how many that I, I do in a week. Now, this can be one that you also invite your family and friends to, or if you have questions from siblings, um, they're welcome to attend, or you can ask a question in their place. So you can ask questions either about family and friends, or you can also ask questions as if you are a mother, a father of a parent, in other words, a grandparent of a client or a student, and then see how I would answer them. So you can you can offer those those, uh, those insights to them if you think that they're, they're valuable or not. So we have some leftover questions from previous broadcasts, so we're going to get to those first, but this is wide open. You're welcome to answer any questions as we go along, and I'll get to those after I get to the pre-submitted leftover questions. So let's begin with the first one. Uh, someone asks, how do we keep forgiving our child and accepting I'm sorry, and then behavior continues? I mean, forgiveness is, is really independent. Well, I, I, there's a few things. Let me take it one step at a time. Forgiveness is independent of whether or not the, the behavior changes. But as I said when I did the podcast, the broadcast, about forgiveness, it is very difficult to forgive in general, in life, for a lot of people. And it's nearly impossible to forgive if it's still happening to you. And so I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I want to make this really, really clear that if you're not able to set boundaries, either because they're not respected or because there's a block in you. And most of the time, I'm thinking of it in terms of the block in you. If you're, for whatever reason, unable to set a boundary, resentment is inevitable. If you're unable to set boundaries, resentment is inevitable. Taking that backwards, resent, resentment is often a sign that we're not setting clear boundaries in our life. My favorite book about boundaries by Dr. Harriet Lerner, The Dance of Anger, where she says, anger is an effective, is effective in our lives if only we allow ourselves to become more clear about ourselves, not about other people. So that's the first part. Forgiveness is hard when it's continuing. I'll talk about in just a moment about how it's independent of behavior, but it's hard when it's still happening. And then just being aware that if you're not able to establish and, and assert boundaries, it's going to be very difficult not to feel anger and resentful. And that's really a, a key to you to go back to the work of boundary setting. Now, let me go to the kind of broader question, which is what I love about therapy. I mean, I'm so grateful to be a therapist. I'm so grateful that I was interested and introduced to this work because the lens of therapy offers a, a kind of compassion that I think is unmatched in the world. You know, when you understand that somebody's woundedness is at the root of the things that they do to protect themselves that essentially hurt other people, it really does offer or invite a kind of compassion and empathy. But here's the key. In psychology, what's also wonderful about the, the lens of therapy is it doesn't preclude setting a boundary. If your empathy, if your sense of compassion and empathy for others, including your children, if it robs you of your boundaries, it's gone too far. And I think the one of the great challenges in this relationship work that we do, that we talk about at Evoke, is holding compassion and empathy for with somebody, but at the same time holding boundaries. We're usually good at one or the other at a time. It's very rare for people to do both at the same time. So the question that you ask is, it's difficult. It's, it's it's a little bit complicated, but those are some of the, the, the keys to it. I would recommend um, a couple of books by Dr. Lerner. The first one being The Dance of Anger. If you really want to learn about boundaries, I think it's a great book, a fresh look at boundaries. And then she has another book called Why Won't You Apologize, which I think gives some nice insights into apologies and forgiveness. 
Someone else asks, if my child's upset, anger and resentment with me is more about them than about me, how do we reconcile that the strong stance for parents who do their own work as having the most impact on their child's progress? Let me read that question again very carefully. If my child's upset, anger, and resentment with me is more about them, then how do we reconcile that with the strong stance for parents who do their own work as having the most impact on the child's progress? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're basically saying if a child being upset and angry with you is, is about them, then how do you figure into that same equation the idea that I constantly present that a parent's impact on a child is important? It's, it's like, it's like a dialectical, something that, that seems to be the opposite that you hold at the same time. In other words, a, a simple dialectical, I talk about in my first book and I borrowed it from somebody else. It's a very common one is I'm doing the best that I can and I can do better. Both of those things, if we can hold both those things at the same time, those are wonderful. Another example of a dialectical that we often work with in our intensive program is I can be mad at my parents and still love them. I can be angry at some of the things that they did and I can still love them. That That's another thing where we learn to hold two things at the same time. The, this is the answer. When my son or my daughter gets angry at me, I listen. I listen to see them and to hear them. And then I, I run it through what I would call the adult brain. This is ideally speaking, of course. I run it through the adult brain. I run it through the adult or the parent filter. I talk to my therapist. I talk to people that I respect, my mentors. I read books. I listen to podcasts. I do my work. And then I see what's in it for me. What's in that feedback or the expression is for me. So when I say what they share about you is a, what the, the feelings they share toward you are about them. It's, it's both are true. You want to listen, you want to hear, you want to be aware, you want to consider it. But many parents become absolutely paralyzed. Sometimes it's just unconscious, but they become paralyzed and, and stuck when their child expresses upset emotions with them because they, they feel like if it's true, they have to do something about it. And so we sort it out. The more grounded that we get, the more clear we get, the more capable we're, we are of sifting through that information quickly, right, in the moment. That's what the work does for us is it builds this foundation where you can express something towards me and I can, because I'm not threatened, because I'm okay, because I've done my work, I can hear you, I can see you and, and see what fits for me. So it's that kind of uh, series of, of thoughts. I hear you. I see you. I think about it. What fits for me? Is there something in, in this that I can own? I was just teaching an in-service today to our, our, our field staff, and I was explaining to them, talking about feedback, is I said, sometimes feedback, you'll get feedback, and you're not going to do anything different. Right? You're going to get feedback from a subordinate or a less experienced person or a student or a child of yours. And you may not do anything different, but you can still hear it. You can still empathize. I think one thing I'll add to this answer is we get better at apologizing. And apologizing, again, doesn't mean that we capitulate, that we dramatically change our behavior, but we empathize with what it feels like to be a child, what it's like to be in their world. And we show sensitivity, compassion, non-judgment. And like I was describing earlier, we retain our, our boundariedness, right? We still stay boundaried if we're talking about the ideal. We can still stay boundaried in that moment. So that's how I would answer that. Regarding forgiveness, somebody asks, and accept, regarding forgiveness and acceptance of feelings, what about when one parent has died after putting the family through a lot of trauma? Should we accept whatever feelings the child has about this parent or help them move towards something? 
if it seems they are stuck in anger or something else. My instinct is it's not your job to move them towards anything. And the way, this is one of the great ironies of this work. The biggest contribution that you can make to anybody's movement toward a, a more resolved and integrated and whole self is to not try to control it and not try to get it there. What's the best thing you could do to encourage forgiveness in your child for your mistakes is let them be angry with you. What's the most helpful thing you can do to contribute to a child kind of letting go of resentment or hurt is you let them feel it. So it wouldn't be my instinct at all to think I know what my child's psychological process is. I can support them. I can be there for them. I can ask questions. I can offer them help if they want it from other adults, that, that therapists that can help them move through the process. But the minute that I see, here's what's happened. The child has been traumatized in this question. The premise of this question is the child has been traumatized. That their, their, their power was taken away from them. So if I, as a quote unquote loving parent or therapist come in and I impose my idea of how quickly and how they should move through, through the process, I am re-traumatizing them because I'm again taking away their power. And so they're likely to become fixated in non-forgiveness and unforgiveness as a way to maintain their sense of self. So I actually contribute to them not getting to where I want them to go or where I think they would be benefited by going. So it, you get out of it. You get in, you, you stand over the side. If symptoms develop, if behavior develops that you're concerned about, you can kind of address that. Sometimes I think behavioral constraints, I think about this in, even at Evoke, I think behavioral constraints are kind of like a funnel where we're taking away um, the acting out behavior so that eventually the person has to talk about it. So if they don't want to talk about it, it's still okay to hold them accountable. I mean, we're, we're going to continue to seek after what they're feeling, what they're, they're, they're going through. But if they've clearly asserted their, their need to, to, to hold it to themselves, then we can hold them accountable for the way they treat us and how they act in their home and in our home and, and so forth. And then eventually they'll have to use their words. But I, I would, my inkling in that example, that question is absolutely to get out of the, get, get, get away from being between a child and not only their deceased parent, like this question described, but the other parent in general, it's not your job to moderate the relationship between your child and somebody else. Next question, somebody asks, through this therapy journey, we have come across many terms and approaches such as DBT, CBT, attachment-based, family systems, trauma-informed, and others that I'm probably forgetting. Can you briefly explain the differences, which one or one's best described Evoke's approach? Our child's new program after transferring from Evoke last month has a strong DBT and expressive approach. Um, I, I have broadcast on, I think CBT and DBT and attachment. So I won't go in a, to great length with them, but what I can say is this with, with, with evoke is that we are, um, our foundation is attachment based. Um, our foundation is, uh, and, uh, analytically based, meaning that we pay attention to the relationship between the therapist and the client, how the therapist feels about the client. When I do supervision with our therapists, I'm talking about how they're feeling toward their clients, their students, their, the parents that they're working with and talking about how that plays into it. So if you're using DBT techniques, which we love, or CBT techniques which and principles, which we love, then all of that rests in this foundation of the awareness that the relationship between if the therapist doesn't like the client, if the therapist is frustrated, impatient, 
angry with the client, it doesn't matter what your technique or theory is. You've just most likely you started to use the, the, the theory and the tools that it comes with to weaponize and punish the client because you're angry or feeling judgmental towards them. Same with parents that we work with. So attachment-based and analytically-based therapies really look at that as the foundation. You know, so at Evoke, we have brain spotting, we have EMDR, we have somatic experiencing, we have DBT, we have CBT, we have therapists that are trained and certified in a variety of models. We have ACT therapists, ACT therapy, um, others, uh, system, family systems therapy. I was trained fundamentally as a family therapist in family systems, um, emotional family therapy, on and on and on, internal family systems, on and on. But those are just kind of techniques, right? Those are just, um, those we encourage the therapist to hold lightly. And by hold light, lightly, what I mean is to not get too attached to your agenda so much so that it eclipses the therapist. We don't want the theory to become more important than seeing the client. I want to read this quote to you. I read this in in-service today. This is from my first book. Okay. I think it's a great quote. Let's see if I can find it again. It'll take a minute, but it's worth it. Um, it goes like this. The emphasis is not on behaviors, but on rigorous thinking. Okay. The emphasis is not on behaviors, but on rigorous thinking. Not on constraints, uh, not on constraints, but on self reflective emotional involvement. I'm going to share it with you on your screen. I think that'll be easier for you to, to, to see it if I can. I don't know if I can do that, actually. I'm not going to be able to do that. I got a little bit too excited about myself. So let me just read it to you. The emphasis is not on behaviors, but on rigorous thinking. Not on constraints, but on self-reflective emotional involvement. Not on the application of general truths, but on imaginative participation. This suggests a very different sort of technique. The discipline, the magic is not in the procedures, but in the sensibility or the way through which the therapist participates. There is no generic solution or technique. There is, in psychotherapy, a great deal of disciplined thought and continual complex choices. So those theories, the techniques, the tenets that come from them, they're helpful, they're useful, they're fantastic tool, but there's something bigger than all of that. And it's the sensibility through which the therapist participates. In other words, it's the way that the therapist is. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. I said this to our staff this morning. I said, this is the magic of therapy. The magic of therapy is that you are different. You are with your clients. You're, you're, and when I say clients, I mean students and clients in the field and also the parents you work with. You are with them in such a different, fundamentally different way that they recognize their previous contexts were not the truth, that they did not grow up in a normal family because there is not one. And that their family didn't have the truth. Their family had a truth, but it wasn't the truth. And so therapy provides a context that, that's so different that you can look back and see your family for what it was. See your family of origin for what it was. You can deconstruct it, which means pull it apart. Be critical of it. Not accept it without chewing it and digesting it. The, the the analogy of the fish 
being the last one to discover water. You can't know what water is if you don't know not water. And so therapy is, in this analogy, is the not water. Therapy is so different. We are with them in such a different way that they start to see more clearly. If any of you have the experience with travel, you find yourself in a small village in Italy and you realize not every place is Kansas City or Bridgeport, Connecticut or Tucson, Arizona, right? Or South Florida. You realize that in those moments because you're somewhere else. So yes, all of those theories are nice to draw upon, but there's something bigger than that that makes the real that makes the real difference. And I see it over and over and over again with new therapists because they get trained in these models and they, they they're just so they want to be helpful. They don't want to do harm. They want to help people, so they cling to these theories so tightly, in, in, in the hope that by doing so they'll be able to help clients, and they don't understand that. What's going on for them is more important than all of that. If it comes from a place of love and genuineness and groundedness and courage and non-judgment, it's hard to get it wrong. If it comes from a place of fear, anger, and judgment, doesn't matter what you say or do, you can't get it right. Someone asked the next question. My son just returned home after 21 months of treatment. He's in his late teens, has two, has two younger teen sisters. Any suggestions on reconnecting as a family? I would ask everybody involved and I would pay attention to their answers. Like I was describing earlier with kind of re-traumatizing somebody about moving them through a process to, to deal with, the, the other question was about a deceased parent. The, I would uh, think in the same terms with siblings. Listen to how the siblings feel. Ask the, the, the child returning from treatment what his thoughts are. And then kind of make decisions from there. I don't think there's one way to do it. I wouldn't, I, I, I would warn against kind of taking your pre preconceived idea about the way that it should go and kind of laying that template over them. I would warn against letting that idea eclipse seeing them. And I would just kind of see where their process is. Ideally, I would love to see everybody in the family acquaint themselves with some of the ideas, concepts, skills, tools that, that your son has been acquainted with. That would be ideal. You could do, I don't want to sell, but you could do a pursuit trip with your family where it's therapy light, right? We have pursuit trips for siblings, family members, extended families, and, and, and students that you could do a family pursuit trip where it, it's therapy light, but you're still having some support. But I would kind of, I, I would encourage you to kind of see and hear where, what all of their needs are. And they might not all be the same too. And then go from there. Next question. Can you explain in depth what choosing how to lose means while also being a responsible parent? My son has major health issues, mental health issues after being abandoned by her biological mom, who was an addict. We assume he was abused at some point and suffers from all sorts of attachment issues. I am struggling to understand how, have it, uh, how to have clear boundaries and tolerate the amount of drama he causes in our family while still parenting him in a way that will lead him to himself, all while choosing how to lose. I don't know how to behave in the situation. I'm feeling very lost. Thank you for asking the question. It sounds like a, a very painful and difficult process. Choosing how to lose, which mean, just means it means two things. It means you don't get to be in, the, in my new book. I, this is kind of the thesis. You don't get to be right. In this work, you do not get to be right anymore. You get to be a self. And being a self is so much better. So your boundaries are because this is what you feel comfortable with. This is what you need. Not because it's the right way to be. 
That's part of choosing how to lose. The other part of choosing how to lose is, you know, there are a lot of situations where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, right? You hold a boundary with your, your loved one and they lash out at you. You don't hold a boundary, you end up resentful. So then you get to choose how to lose. You want to hold a boundary and have them lash out? But what you don't get is you don't get to set, in this example, you don't get to set set a boundary and have them be happy about it. That is clear. That's choosing how to lose. So it's not about being passive. It has no, choosing how to lose has no connection to behavior. It's a mindset. Here's my boundary. You can hate it if you want to. This is my limit. You can do with it what you want to. You have to learn that as a therapist because so many clients present unsolvable problems, right? Problems where there's no win, win. There's a lose, lose. And so you learn that as a therapist, like, yeah, I can't think of a way through this mess without some kind of consequence. If you hold a boundary with your alcoholic spouse, they might leave. And if you don't, well, we know how that goes. So you get to choose how to lose. It's freeing people up from the idea that they can somehow, with enough cleverness, figure out how to come out on top. And in this work, you don't get to come out on top. You get to come out with who you are. And like I said just a moment ago, it's so much better to come out of it with who you are than it is to come out a winner. Coming out a winner is fun and nice, but it's tenuous. Next question. Thank you for normalizing the experience of hearing my child's story as unbelievable and the advice of viewing it as a dream. While grateful that Evoke has been able to bring these feelings to the surface, it hurts bad to hear his lived experience. I am doing my work, but it is difficult to come to terms uh, that he experienced his childhood badly. Any advice on how to move on? Um, You're doing it. You know, just hang out with people that don't try to make you feel better. Hang out with people who... um, Hang out with people who can sit with you in your unsolvable problems. Hang out with people who understand and can empathize and that it's hard. You know, I I will tell you this, folks. This is important. There's something on the other side of this. At first, when you start to do this work and you lean into the, the failure your life has been, that you weren't able to get everything right, there's freedom on the other side. There's love, there's generosity. You know, it, it's it's like um, the enlightened ones talk about. The enlightened ones laugh at their follies, tease themselves about their idiocies without shame, admit to their mistakes effortlessly, welcome other people's expressions of hurt and anger. See, part of what's happening, the, the weight that you're carrying is that you're carrying the idea from previous generations that being a good parent was getting it right. You cannot not dent your children and you will dent them more or less. And you will dent them because you are dented. So you can beat yourself up for being dented if you want to. But that seems kind of silly in the long run, doesn't it? You have to kind of cultivate and find some self-love to move through it. But we were taught, all of us were taught to feel bad about our mistakes when they hurt other people. And I don't blame the previous generation for teaching us that in the sense that that's what they thought and what they were taught too. But you don't have to. And so eventually, the more you do this work, the more people come up to you and say, hey, you hurt me. Hey, you you dented me. Hey. You offended me and your response is, it's not contrived, it's not a skill. It's naturally, easily 
something like, I'm so glad you're telling me. Thanks for talking about it. Thanks for sharing it with me. Right? That that's that's what it sounds like. It sounds like this. It sounds like those things on the left. And those things on the left on your screen, thanks for telling me. Tell me more. I appreciate knowing versus that's silly, you're overreacting, you're too sensitive. It's it you just it it's it's it comes from a place of strength. It comes from a place of abundance. It comes from a place of self. It comes from a place of self-love. It comes from a place of, of, of knowing you're okay. So that's where it eventually gets to, which you have to look forward to. You have to break through that shell, that, 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 that idea that we've been encased with that just isn't true. That, that, Self-punishment and self-judgment is not the pathway to enlightenment and awareness. Self-love is. And guilt and shame. Guilt and shame are not vehicles for awareness and long-lasting change. They are part of the problem. Both of them. Not just shame, which everybody kind of agrees with, but guilt also. Another parent asks, at what point do we stop trying to fix the outcome? I, I don't think I can do this. That's why my kid is at a vogue. It's, it's, it's another kind of nuanced idea. When I teach this work to, to new therapists, they'll say to me in desperation, but Brad, you, you got to help us because we've been hired to facilitate change in our clients. And my response is, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. I don't know if the person who wrote the question has ever played tennis or thrown a, a baseball or a softball. But maybe you can imagine it if you haven't. <clears throat> if you're playing tennis and you aim it, you lose power and accuracy. You kind of have to swing and let go. You, you, you study, you practice, you go through the exercises. But then during the game, if you try to aim it, you lose everything that you're looking for. If you're trying to control other people, you won't tell the truth. Telling the truth is the simplest example of behavior that comes when we let go of outcomes, of trying to control people. Throwing a baseball. Any of you ever played a sport where you got your confidence was shaking, shaken, and you try to aim it, the ball, the, the the whatever, you know what happens. You lose accuracy. In other words, you don't get the goal that you want. So there are basically two forces in the universe. There's, there's fear and love. And, and if we are operating from a place of fear, of reactions and consequences and control, we will lie. We'll lose our authenticity. We'll try to control and manipulate people. So keep listening. Keep listening to the podcast. Read the books. Go, go to the meetings, right? It, it, it will give you what you want. It's not not caring. It's not not trying. Sending a child to evoke can be letting go. Letting go is something you do spiritually inside of here. You, you you learn to change your relationship with the other person and with their disordered thinking and behavior and behavior. You you choose how to lose. And evoke is choosing how to lose. I'm gonna send my kid to evoke and they're gonna be angry and resentful. You've chosen to lose that way. I'm gonna send a set a boundary with my alcoholic or abusive spouse. I'm not gonna to try to get them to stop drinking or abusing me. I've spent the first 15 years of our marriage trying to do that. I give up on that project. Therefore, I'm setting this boundary. I choose to lose this way. I let go of that outcome. And the fantastic, wonderful, magical irony of it all goes with playing tennis 
and intimate relationships is you more often get what you want when you let go than when you try to control it. You know, you know why drunk people don't get as injured in car accidents as sober people? One of the reasons? Because they flop around like a rag doll. If you and I were about to hit a tree sober, we would tense up. It's, 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 it's what our body does during moments of minor trauma to protect us from injury, which works when the trauma is minor. When it's major, it can cause great injury. The drunk or the passed out person who runs into a tree is a rag doll. They have let go of trying to protect themselves and they get less hurt. Bad example, perhaps, but it's true. By letting go, they get less hurt. By trying to, us, you know, me and you, we would hold onto the steering wheel, we'd put our arms out, we'd lock our elbows, strain our necks, injuries galore. Ideally, if we were about to run into a tree, we would just relax. That's about how hard this parenting task is, right? You're about to hit a tree. Just relax. Let go. Metaphorically speaking. Next question. If there is time, can you talk about how your post about Trump about Trump earlier this week? Uh, know someone by knowing their enemies and how by reacting with disgust makes Trump their champion. Um I'm a little bit nervous about talking about politics. I posted something on the on my social media. I'll just say this where I wasn't criticizing or or trying to advocate for one side of the political spectrum or the other. I was just talking about understanding each other and how um you know, the division that's happening in our country is the responsibility of everybody. So I think that's all I want to say about that. I, I, if I, this podcast were not, this were just my podcast, I might might share it. But um, if you want to follow me at drbradreed.com, you can look at those posts there or go to drbradreed.com um, on Instagram, drbradreed, or, or, or on the web on drbradreed.com. You can read my post there. Next question. Why would letting go sometimes feel like giving up, giving in, or being in denial? It, it's just the way some people think about it. It's Some people equate letting go with passivity. They, they don't, letting go is such a spiritual thing, right? It's, it's trusting, it's radical acceptance, it's faith, it's love, it's courage, it's, it's facing your fear. So I, I don't think it is, but some people assume letting go means do nothing, become passive, get walked on, don't assert boundaries, don't make tough choices, don't set limits. That's just it's just it's a it's a it's a simplified kind of top layer version of it. It's not really what's going on, and that's why I think the work is complicated for people. All right, I'm going to go to upcoming announcements, and then we'll go back to any questions. If you want to do deeper dive into your work, in fact, I think the in-person intensives are filling up because we we have protocols, testing. Um, you have to get here a day early. So the, the in-person intensives are both uh, Finding You and Finding You Too are filling up. There's some spaces left, but I think just maybe one. Um, finding You Online is also available. So if you want a two and a half day experience online, you can do Finding You Online. Embracing You, we have... Uh, upcoming uh, uh, um, three-day intensive for, it's three days. I should fix this slide. I always do it wrong. It's a three-day intensive uh, online for uh, women of color and facilitated by all women of color. Judith Sedora uh, is the lead therapist. She works at Evoke. Um, that's coming up in September. Okay. More information, more questions. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. Again, I'm proud of our, our team. I'm proud of our approach. I think it's unique in the field. 
of intensive work. Like I mentioned earlier, pursuits and adventure trips are, are kind of therapy light. You can do adventure trips for fun. Think of reconnecting. Think of sober fun. Think of therapy light with our therapeutic staff. This can be arranged in between Evoke and the next step. It can be uh, uh, after your child comes home. It can be somewhere in the middle where you're just trying to, you, you know, you might not need that complete reset, but you want a safe, fun place to visit with still a, a safety net of therapy work um upcoming parent support groups on august 20th adam is going to be running it at 6 p.m mountain time if you are an intensive alumni travis slagle our clinical director of our intensive program will be running the intensive support group coming up on september 8th at 6 p.m mountain time contact malia at evoketherapy.com for more information we ask all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups any combination of al-anon coda Families Anonymous, Adult Children, also refugerecovery.org and nami.org are great resources for support groups, educational programs in your area that are free. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast. I would love for any of all of you to give us a review, to, to share it. Um, you can also go to soundcloud.com and search the same title, Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy and Evoke Therapy Intensives by using the handle at Evoke Therapy or at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. You can find the Family Foundation. We need new energy, new uh, more people um, to help with the Family Foundation. So go to evokefamilyfoundation.org or you can find them on Facebook. And of course, the blog is always getting new content. My first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon, also Audible. The Audacity to Be You, my most recent book, is also available on Amazon. And it will be out on Audiobook soon. I'm just waiting for it to be approved. I think it will be in the coming days, but I'll let you know exactly. I actually recorded the second one, so I'm excited to share that with you. Any last questions before we wrap up? And I want to go back to... All right. No questions we're tweaking the schedule a little bit. So here's the schedule for next week. Okay. Uh, the next one will be Tuesday, August 25th at 6 PM mountain time. And I'll be talking about how to choose the right aftercare for your child. After that Monday, August 31st at 6 30 PM mountain time. We'll be talking about your inner child. And on Wednesday, September 2nd, at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, we'll be talking about therapy fatigue. See, the deal is I have to go to New York and quarantine for two weeks because I'm dropping my son off at college. So I'm moving him a little bit earlier. I have empathy for all, all of you on the East Coast who have to deal with late night programming and webinars and so forth. So that's why we're doing the earlier times. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope it's a helpful point of contact. I hope I got to all your questions. And um, for and in behalf, of your child and your loved ones. Thanks for joining us and for doing your work. Take care, folks. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.